enjoy a Christmas tradition from long ago. Eggnog, festive lights and ancient monsters rampaging the land. What's not to love? Hi, and welcome to Dark Christmas Tales Advent Calendar. This tale is called Eggnog, written by Angela Blythe and read by the author. Would it have got out anyway? I reckon so. We'll never honestly know. Was it my fault? What if I hadn't said anything? I mustn't blame myself, really. After all, it wasn't me that did the killing. It makes you think, though, doesn't it? What if I had said nothing? I live in the country, in a house with very little around it. It's a flat area, apart from what I thought was a Neolithic barrow or burial mound, about a quarter of a mile away from my house. Every morning, I open my bedroom curtains and see it. It's a welcome respite from the grassy plains around it. It's quite lovely, especially if I get up early enough and see the sunrise behind it. Last winter, it was unusually cold. Perhaps... It was that which started it. Although with global warming, we must have had colder winters in the hundreds of years it's been there. There is little drainage around here, so everything becomes wet quickly. The waterlogged ground became frozen for a long time. Deep fissures were everywhere, making the field look like a cracked eggshell. Eggs. It's weird that I should bring that up considering what they found. Anyway, back to the story. The cracks in the mud widened each day with the frost, getting deeper. Some were two feet thick and six inches wide. The temperature was well below freezing for three weeks. One morning, I opened my curtains to find out that instead of a bright, frosty day, it was a grey, milder, rainy day. But by rainy, I mean torrential. The rain flooded the cracks, dislodging the frozen clumps of earth above. These clumps rose. The plains looked like lumpy porridge. Some lumps were torn loose with the wind and rain, settling on the surface elsewhere, homeless and sad. No one went out there for several weeks. No dog walkers or hikers. It was a lumpy, wet, dangerous area to be in. When it started warming up in May, I noticed something strange. A lighter object was on top of the burial mound to one side. I saw it for a few days before I decided to wander over to see what it was. The ground still took some navigating. The previous winter weather conditions had ruined it, but it was dry and quite safe as long as you watched your step. Cracks were still evident, and I twisted my ankle a couple of times, although not badly. I walked up to the top of the mound, which I had done many times. It was probably about 30 or 40 feet high. When I got closer, the object was much more prominent. It looked like the corner of a larger object, made of a type of stone. I tried with both hands to roll it over. Then I realised that it was buried. The frost and rain had exposed this buried corner. I got a stick and moved the earth to check that I was right. It was then that I saw what I thought was a little bit of carving on it. This was interesting. On the walk back home, I toyed with what to do. I didn't really want to make a fuss, but I thought the best thing was to contact someone. If this were of historical importance, inevitably, being exposed to the elements would start its deterioration. It had been safe inside the soil for who knows how long. I found the email address of the local museum and told them of my find. I heard nothing for a week. Each day, using wood, I removed some of the earth around the edges. I knew enough to not use metal tools. The rock or stone looked porous and delicate, like an ash-coloured sandstone. Each day, on one face of the object, I revealed more and more of the carving. It seemed to be a pattern of intricate scrolls, 
There was no lettering, as far as I could see. I would imagine that it would be crude, and I wouldn't understand it if there was. Even the ancient Egyptians had an alphabet, so I believe that the early Britons that had buried this had one too. It just looked up to yet that they hadn't written on it. I began to enjoy it. I was glad that the museum had ignored my email, because then I wouldn't have all the fun. This was all mine now. Imagine my disappointment when I got home on the ninth day of digging to find an email. The person who I needed to speak to had been on her honeymoon. It had been forwarded to her by the secretary, and now she was back. It was signed Lily Owen, Mrs. She would like to view it tomorrow if possible. I emailed back and the mutual time of 10am was arranged. I knew the archaeologist was a lady, but wasn't prepared for the red-haired Laura Croft type goddess that turned up at my door. She introduced herself in person and we set off. I told her what I had been doing and what I had discovered. I thought she went a bit quiet when I told her that I'd been scraping at it with a stick. Lily was worried that I'd damaged it. I told her about the carvings. When she saw the corner that was exposed now, probably three feet all around, she was amazed. She looked at it for a long time, touching the carving and rubbing the rock gently with her fingers, walking around the site, up and down the messy barrow, over and over again. You have discovered something incredibly significant, Lily said to me. Perhaps one of the most exciting artifacts ever to be found. I thought she was spinning me a line, but it was still nice to hear that my work was going to be appreciated. What I'd like you to do is let us take it from here. I'll get this area fenced off and put a team together. I know lots of people will want to come here to see this and help expose it, Rowley really said. We walked back. Little was said. Rowley really spent the whole time emailing and texting people on her phone. When we got back to the car, she announced that everyone was interested and they were in the process of freeing themselves up for the dig. On the following Monday, I saw them arrive and park on the nearest road to the site. Young men, old bearded men, there were plenty of those, and several jean-clad ladies. Rilly proudly led them in, her red hair in a bun. She was heading off to the barrow the crew behind her. I watched from my bedroom window with a cup of tea. I had invested in a new pair of binoculars and put them to good use, stopping when my eyes began to ache. I returned later after lunch, then at about 3pm. They seemed to be walking around a lot and not really digging. That was disappointing. I was hoping to see more of the find. It was easy enough. I mean... I'd exposed a lot just with bog wood. They set the fence perimeter up around the site at least. The next day, they made a lot of progress. The whole top of the rock was exposed by the end of the day. It looked to be about 8 to 10 feet wide and 15 feet long. Far too big for a coffin, I thought. During the next few days, they worked downwards. I expected that it was a stone kind of box, and the top face was its length. The archaeologist dug down six feet, ten feet, and still there was more. Now this looked like a carving that was standing on its end, and it was stunning. Lily came to visit me on her way home to tell me the news. Did she really think I hadn't been watching out of my bedroom window? But what I couldn't tell from my vantage point was that there were only carvings on the front face. The carvings were symmetrical, with a central line down the middle. Lily said it reminded her of the giant carved wardrobe out of the Narnia books. No hinges, unfortunately, so it's not going to open like a wardrobe. None of the faces look like they could be removed either, Lily said sadly. Do you know anything about it? Can you doubt it? I asked. There are a few theories. None that I can share will have been verified, I'm afraid, she said. I'll tell you what, though, you'll be the first to know. The rest of the dig took months. 
It was more the problem of removing the soil gently from the entire hill so that we could get lower. I didn't know if there were any more monoliths or artifacts alongside the now enormous ancient structure in the centre. At night, or in the rain, they covered it up with plastic sheeting. The majority of the work was done in the summer. I wandered up during late August and spoke to Lily again. We've x-rayed it. It has a chamber inside, Lily told me excitedly. Still not found the bottom of it, though. There's a theory that it's carved from a much bigger piece, which is anchored below. Do you mean it was a piece of rock jutting upwards which had been carved? I asked. No, that's just it. We've discovered that it's not local rock. We know it's sedimentary rock. I've called in a geologist to tell us where it comes from. It must have been brought here by ship. Why, I don't know, Lily said. It certainly was food for thought. Why would a group of people put a giant carved rock in the middle of nowhere? It must have been terribly heavy to drag here. I went up again at the end of September. The carved section had been fully exposed now, and they were digging at ground level. The rock carried on beneath, but the carving had stopped. Lily let me into the dig site that day. The days were getting shorter, and they were finishing earlier. Their work was mainly done, I suppose. Just a skeleton crew of about five scientists remained. The carving was now clean and beautiful. Curves and swirls ran equally down the colossal mass of rock. It did look like a wardrobe. Did you find out where the rock was from? I asked. No, the geologist couldn't tell us, Lily said. Are you going to open it? I asked. I don't think so, but we're going to be around studying it. I doubt it will be moved ever, Lily told me. I was glad. I felt it was part mine now. I had discovered it, and no one lived closer. I'd lost my barrow, but had gained this. Two weeks later, there was a blood moon. Everyone was very excited about it, and I stood looking across the flat plains from my bedroom window. It was a windy night and cold. That was why I wasn't viewing the moon from outside. The plastic sheeting was flapping around the monolith, and the front part got lifted up and rose off like a sail coming to rest far away. I could see the whole of the front of it. It was dark, so I just saw a black oblong sticking out of the ground. When the moon rose, it looked spectacular behind the monolith. The other huge plastic sheet had been blown away too now. There was just enough light on the rock to give it some shadows and features. I have to admit, I got tired, staring out at the darkness, and pulled up a chair to watch in comfort. The moon was moving, but still beautiful, and I wouldn't get to see one of these every night. I woke about an hour later, glancing outside. There was no moon now, but there was light. It was coming from the monolith. To be exact, it was coming from the carved lines on there. I rubbed my eyes. Yes, it was still there. The light seemed to pulse. It was a cream colour, perhaps more on the yellow side than the white, but certainly in the middle. It wasn't vibrantly neon. It was more like a light shone through milk. How had this happened? This must be because the sheets had blown off. And was it the moon? Had it been glowing under the sheets before and I just couldn't see it? I had no reason to look at it under its sheets in the dark, as I could see it in the daytime. I was up early that day. I hadn't slept much, in fact. And I just waited by the side of the road where Lily parked. When she arrived, I told her the whole story. Her mouth dropped open. She had never heard of such a thing. She had given a young archaeologist to lift to the dig, and all three of us made our way up to the mysterious object. We were to have another shock. 
out of the carvings. Something extruded out of the rock. We couldn't see it at first from a distance, as it wasn't heavy enough to flow down. But it was at the base of every inch of carving. A creamy fluid, just the same colour as the light I'd seen. A student, Josh, took a sample with the spatula he had. He was just about to put it in the bag when he caught a whiff of it. He frowned, smelling deeper, before bursting out laughing. I think someone's played a trick on us, he said to Lily, tilting his eyes towards me. I didn't know what he was on about. Josh gave the spatula to Lily to smell. She got it straight away. It smells like eggnog, Lily laughed. Never, I said. She passed the spatula to me, and I sniffed the end of it carefully. They were right. Josh wiped his finger down one of the carved lines to gather up more of the fluid. He rubbed his fingers together. It is in the shops now, I suppose, nearly the season, Josh said, winking at me. I hope you don't think that's me, I said. Lily and Josh said nothing. Someone else must have done that. It doesn't explain the glowing, does it? Maybe it's some kind of special glowing eggnog, Josh said. Luke, Lily said. For two or three inches that Josh had wiped clean with his finger, now had eggnog on again. She rubbed her fingers down the same place and looked at them. She looked back at the dry area. The eggnog began seeping through the grains in the sedimentary stone. Lily looked upwards. Perhaps she expected to see Father Christmas dipping a giant bottle of eggnog through the cracks, as if he was feeding his Christmas cake brandy. We were alone. What's happening? I don't understand, Lily said. We've uncovered an untapped well of eggnog, Josh said jokingly. Lily didn't laugh. I don't think so, she said, rubbing her fingers together again. Lily had noticed that the fluid had tiny particles of sedimentary rock in it. So began the next few weeks of the next instalment in this mystery. The archaeologists returned, but now with biologists and chemists. At night, the stone glowed. Day and night, the eggnog, that's what everyone called it for want of a better name, oozed out of the carving. By the time it had come to the bottom of the structure, it was full of particles of rock. Slowly the indentations got deeper, which seemed to make the process speed up. There was more surface area for the eggnog to leak out of. I walked up to the site. From my window, it looked a different shape now. I would have to say, deflated, as if the corners had sunk in a little. It looked smaller. Lily, you said it had a hollow centre. What if the thing inside is rotting, leaking out? I asked. I hope not, we've all had our hands in it, Lily laughed. Then she stopped immediately, realising that this wasn't actually funny. It could be true. Just because it had a fun scent, it didn't mean it was a fun thing. Some of the samples had been sent to various laboratories around the world. A couple of geologists were visiting universities, updating professors and students on the exciting find. A few days later, Josh got ill. Some kind of boil on his hand appeared. It looked just like a deep, round burn. I saw it earlier that day. By the afternoon, he had twenty up his arm. Lily had one on her fingertip. Hers burst and spread too. Josh died at 4am. I couldn't tell why, apart from the boils. Lily was in hospital too. She lasted until lunchtime. People put two and two together and came up with the right answer. 
I watched from my window. I wasn't going to go up there again. I used my binoculars to check the state of the monolith. The centre crack was widening. I wasn't about to go up there and tell them. Thank God I hadn't touched the eggnog. They put a big cordon around the monolith. The army was put on duty. Every scientist died. Each person that had touched it. Each person they had touched. On a plane. For a family. In the shop. In the university. Died. Everyone they touched. Died. There was no cure. It seemed no one had a resistance to this infection. I was infected, but not in the same way. I was obsessed with this phenomenon, so close to me. There was still no word about what it was, where it had originally come from, who had put it there, or what infection was in the eggnog. Most interestingly, what was going to happen next? I watched it constantly. I knew there was another stage. One night it happened. By this time, the carving in the centre crack was so deep that there seemed to be more glowing parts than not glowing. They pulsed brighter tonight. I noticed the centre crack light getting more vivid. I stood up, got closer to the window and raised my binoculars to my eyes. I could see the soldiers turning round. A couple of them put their hands over their ears. I opened my window to listen. There was a noise, but it was more like a sensation of air being forced against your eardrum rhythmically. I focused my binoculars on the monolith. It was opening. The eggnog fluid began free-flowing from the centre. Behind it, as the doors opened, the glow got brighter, and I was glad of it as it illuminated the contents beautifully. Inside was a figure, wet and slimy due to the eggnog. There was a chance that this was its skin. The shape reminded me of the Minotaur from some old Jason and the Argonauts film, a misshapen human body, thick set and muscly. Its head was much wider than a human's with what looked like horns at the top, or horn-shaped ears. The forehead and eyebrows were massive. The eyes were small, and it had what I would describe as a snout. Out of its thick lips hung several dripping tusks. The arms were unnaturally long, with giant, powerful hands at the end. The poisonous eggnog glowed in a creamy lake in front of the now crumbling box. The soldiers ran towards it, shouting. It opened its eyes and took its first step towards them. That was A Dark Christmas Tale, written and read by Angela Blythe. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about further stories in this series, or my other work, please go to www.angelablythe.com. Mm-hmm.